to you here today. And uh, it's a good, good big group for the first service. So we're thankful that you're with us today. And today is also a Feast of Tabernacles that we're celebrating. The Feast of Tabernacles started last week, Sunday evening. And it will end tonight or this, this evening when the sun sets. So uh, we, in the last part of the Feast of Tabernacles, in front fort, uh, everybody's waiting for the rain. And the amazing thing, every year when we celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, it rains. So yesterday it just gave us a little bit of just excitement that the rain will be here. Um, I hope you brought your umbrellas with you. Uh, because when you leave, you might have to run in the rain or whatever. So we're thankful to God. For those watching us, um, we're not Jewish. Um, we're not, uh, uh, we are Gentiles. But being Gentiles, we are also, uh, we also celebrate not Jewish feasts. But the feast of the Bible, and the feast of the Bible in the uh, the, the first few feasts of the Bible, uh, Passover speaks about our being born again and being set free from sin. Uh, Pentecost speaks about the the uh, Spirit, Holy Spirit coming upon the church and also coming upon us. And then the feast of Tabernacles focuses focuses on the big wedding feast. Where we will be with Christ forever. So the first few feasts, the, the, the three feasts of, of Passover and the feast of Pentecost speaks about what has already happened and what God and Jesus already fulfilled. But the feast of Tabernacles speaks about what he will still fulfill. So a few weeks ago we, we had the feast of trumpets which speaks about when the trumpet blows Christ will come and we will be raptured up with him uh, forever. Uh, and then the, 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 the Feast of uh, Atonement, the Day of Atonement, we spoke about uh, Jesus coming in and, and, and bringing us back with Him because He comes for seven, uh, seven, uh, for a thousand years, sorry, uh, where there will be peace on earth, where the, the devil will be bound. But the Feast of Tabernacles focuses on the wedding feast and the feast where we can be together with Him. So uh, today I want to, my message might not just fit completely in the feast, although I believe everything fits into the feast, um, uh, but today my title is How Fast Can You Run? So let's pray together so, we can, so you can get your Adidas or your uh, whatever running shoes on so that you can be ready to run today. Let's pray together. Father, we bless you and we thank you that we can be joined together in uh, a time, and especially today, where we celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. We just come pray that your presence, which we already experience and know, that we will feel your presence today as you come to set us free. Not to set us free uh, so that we can go to heaven one day, but set us free so that we can live the victory that you have given us here on earth. Thank you for your goodness, your greatness, your awesomeness, and we just bless you and love you, in Jesus' name, Amen. For those watching us on Facebook and uh, possibly YouTube, we're struggling a little bit with, with YouTube at the moment, uh, but or, or with Facebook getting it off onto YouTube, but uh, hopefully it will be sorted. But those of you that are watching us, uh, let me just say that unfortunately, uh, when the service, or when the message is finished, we have to stop. Uh, just for copyright reasons on the songs that we sing but we will carry on those that are here we will carry on into a time of celebration and i want to maybe not challenge you i want to get you excited that maybe you will just stay a little bit longer in the worship time um, and maybe even stay for the second service if you have time or maybe you don't have time but maybe you can make time but uh, maybe it's important enough and no, no, let me not put you under any guilt or condemnation but uh, we're going to have a great time we have our dancers will be dancing with us and we can just, just just have a great time together in the presence of God uh, for those of us that are here and we will also obviously together have a communion today right my message how fast can you run and just with my introduction, I took five minutes of my time already. 
so I can add 10 minutes. All right, let's read from Genesis 39. Genesis 39. I want to, uh, we're speaking about living the victory. And so my, my, my message is focused today on how do we live victory over sin. Many people come and they say, I know God forgave me for my sin. I know I'm free from sin, but you, I still struggle with sin. Okay, and I and, and it's as if there's a, a magnet on this side of, of uh, where, where sin is, and it just keeps drawing me back. And then, uh, and sometimes I get caught in it, and sometimes. And today, I want to give us a message on how can we live victory over sin. And uh, so let's start and read about. One of my favorite characters in the Bible, Joseph. So Joseph found favor in the sight and in Potiphar's sight and attended him. And, and Potiphar made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. Let me just give you a little bit of background. Joseph was taken, thrown into the pit by his brothers. Uh, he was sold as a slave and uh, he came into Potiphar's house as a slave. Verse 5, from that, from the time that jo Joseph, or from the time, sorry, that Potiphar made Joseph oversee in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. Let me just stop. I'm going to stop a lot while we're reading the scripture, uh, uh, just giving you a few just points uh, that when Joseph came into Potiphar's house, Potiphar was a Gentile. Potiphar was uh, not a Jew. Potiphar was not part of God's chosen people. Potiphar was not born again. Potiphar was not, he was just a, a heathen. All right. But when Joseph came into his house, everything that Potiphar had was blessed. Let me challenge you. Well, let me ask you the question. There where you are, there where you work, there where you are, is that place blessed? Is your boss blessed? Is the business blessed? Is the farm where you work blessed? Is the place where you are blessed? Because we bring the favor of God even to the sinner's homes. And to the sinners' places. All right. So just that was just extra. All right. Okay, let's carry on. Uh, so, uh, verse six. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now, ladies, Joseph was like Michael. No, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. That was just a joke. Okay. Um, but many a truth is spoken in a joke, so just don't know. But anyway, now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. Now, lie with me wasn't tell lies together with me. Okay? It was getting to bed with me. Lie with me. But Joseph refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. Now then, can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, in other words, no other servants were there, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her, in her hand and fled and got out of the house. He fled and got out of the house. I've got two basic points that I want to share today. The first point is that Jesus comes in our lives and when we repent of our sins and when we ask Him for forgiveness of our sins, He removes our sins from us. 
All right? We can, there's two ways to get rid of sin. Through the law or through Christ. There's two ways. You can choose which way you want to do it. Through the law or through Christ. The problem with the law is, James 2 verse 10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point, has become guilty of all of it. So if you want to have your sins removed by the law, in other words, by your works, by trying to, to be holy, by trying to live a good life, by trying to be good, you can only make it if you never ever in your life ever make a mistake. As soon as you make one mistake, you're guilty of all the law. So there's two ways, but the one way no one has ever achieved it. So you probably won't either. The second way to get rid of our sins is through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the second way, through the blood of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ comes, He comes and He sets us completely free. Now let me give you an understanding. I've got two boards here is that on the, can we see that? All right. Two boards here written sin. This one is sin when you want to get rid of your sin through the law. This one is when you will allow Christ to get to get rid of your sin for you. All right. So let's read Leviticus four verse twenty seven. This is the law. I've got so much to say and, and, and I don't want to just, but I need to say this because this is probably one of the most important things because we struggle and Christians struggle to believe that God really set them free and cleansed them from their sin. So let's read, read under the law, Leviticus 4 verse 27 to 31. Let's read there. If any one of the common people sins unintentionally and he speaks before that about the, the priests and everybody that do basically the same thing but when any one of the common people sins unintentionally in doing any one of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done and realizes his guilt or the sin which he has committed is made known to him he shall bring for his offering a goat a female without blemish for his sin which he has committed and he shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and kill the sin offering in the place of burnt offering. And the priest shall take some of his blood with his fingers, a finger and put it on the horns of the altar of the burnt offering and pour out all the rest of its blood at the base of the altar. And all its fat he shall remove as the fat is removed from the peace offerings. And the priest shall burn it on the altar for a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And the priest, listen, shall make atonement for him and he shall be forgiven the priest shall make atonement now as you know I love going back to the original the word atonement means to cover means to cover so what happens is when you sin and you realize you've sinned you got to bring your goat or your, your lamb. Uh, you got to bring this animal to the priest. Then they can slaughter this animal and, and you put your hand on it and you, trans, you try to transfer your sin onto the animal. And, and then the animal is sacrificed to God. And through doing that, the priest, as he sacrifices this animal, he, he covers your sin. Alright? He covers your sin. So yes, sir. Yes, your sin under the law. Uh, Joshua, I hope you can still see me on the uh, there. Yes, your sin under the law. All right. Now, what happens under the law is that the priest comes, and when he makes atonement, just. He whitewashes your sin. Oh, and this white 
brush isn't even enough to cover the sin completely. <laughs> okay? But he whitewashes your sin. Oh, there's enough paint to, to paint the tent out so we can just keep on doing that because the problem is your sin gets covered under the law. And if I had, if this could dry quick enough, I will give it another coat and another coat and another coat. Because every time you sin, you come to the priest, you bring your animal, the priest slaughters the animal, and he covers your sin. Isn't that amazing? Your sin. The more he covers, the more sacrifices you bring, the less of your sin will be seen. That's amazing. Huh? Cover your sin. The problem is, he can only cover your sin. The problem is, is your sin gone? Your sin is not gone, your sin is still there. We can still see the outline of sin. It's not as clear anymore as it was, but the outline of your sin is still there. And I'll, but it won't get dry that quickly. I'll give it another coat just now for us to show. All right. So that's what happens under the law. Every time we come under the law, every time we try to get rid of our sin, Every time we struggle with, uh, with lying, uh, every time we lie, uh, we, we try to cover up our lies and we try to put it in our past. And most Christians, we call it repentance because repentance means a changing of mind. We try to get a changing of mind. But we don't repent, uh, we don't repent to Christ, we just repent from sin. And that was what was happening all along. The people were just repenting from sin, but they were never repenting to God. And so their sins were covered because it was atonement that was made for their sin. But in Jesus, listen to this, in Jesus, John 1 verse 29, John the Baptist sees Jesus and he, and he calls out the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, when Jesus came, Jesus didn't come to cover our sin. Jesus came Sometimes when Jesus takes us in the way, it looks like a mess. Until we allow it, He just continually cleanses us from the sin. Okay? I maybe put too much on there, but we can never have too much of the blood of Jesus. He removes our sin. Jesus comes not to cover our sins but to remove our sins. And some of you sitting here today and some of you watching me today, you have confessed your sins. You've asked God to forgive you for your sins. But in your heart, you just feel that God has just covered your sin. Let's see if we can cover it a little bit more. Uh, we can, if we just keep on going, we will cover it completely. Okay? Ah. Okay, that's going to take too much time. Uh, there's a difference between having your sins covered and having your sins removed. There's a big difference. Having your sins 
covered and having your sins removed. When Jesus came and he died on the cross, he removed it. Listen to this, this scripture in Hebrews 10 verse 3. Uh, there's a whole lot of scriptures in Hebrews 10. But I'll, let's read 3 and 4 first. But in these sacrifices, speaking about the law, in these sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. Your sins are not taken away forever. Your sins are taken away, but the next time you need to come again, and you've got to come and bring a sacrifice again, and yearly you bring a sacrifice. For it is impossible, listen, the Bible says this, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It's impossible for your sins to be taken away by being under the law and trying harder. Trying harder not to do the sins. Trying and, and, and trying to please God and trying to do all kinds to, to get rid of your sins. It's impossible. Then verse, verse, verse 10, 11 to 12. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. This is all in the Bible. Okay. Which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, He sat down at the right hand of God. It was finished. Remember when He was hanging on the cross? And He said, it is finished. That word in the Greek is tetelesta. He said, Tetelestai, Tetelestai says, the price is now paid in full. It was actually a business term. If you owed someone money, and, and, and uh, you came and you paid the last amount, and you put it down, they would write across your, 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 your account, what you owed. They would write across there, Tetelestai, it is now paid in full. You do not owe ever again on this account. This is what Jesus does. He comes and he says, Tetelesta, it is finished. It is paid in full. You will not, you will not have to carry this anymore in your life. Jesus, and then verse, verse 18, 17 and 18, he says, Then he adds, I will remember their sins. And their lawless deeds no more. What, what it actually says is, I will never think on their sins again. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. So Jesus says, when I forgive you your sin, you don't have to bring a sacrifice anymore. I've already paid the price. You know what? It is so simple that most Christians can't believe it. If, you know the saying that we, that, that we say, and it's true in, in, when it comes to money. If it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. But when we come to this, we've still got that same mindset and we say, if this is too good to be true, it must be too good to be true. It cannot be true. I want to tell you the truth is, when Jesus forgives you your sin, He removes it from you completely. And it's never ever part of your life. Listen to what 1 John 1 verse 9 says. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, not to cover us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that amazing? I thought some of you were going to jump up and go, Woo! I'm waiting for that someday. Uh, because it's so amazing. When we confess our sins, He removes it. Uh, I've told you the story many times, so I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but when I get to prison, the biggest issue that the prisoners have, because when we go to Frunpan prison, uh, we're in maximum, that's where people, uh, uh, they, that's where the murderers are, that's where the, 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 the uh, 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 rapists are, that's where the child molestation, uh, molesters are, that's where the, the, the worst crimes is in maximum. Okay, the petty crimes is in medium, like Frankfurt, yeah, not Frankfurt, 
Frankfurt prison. Okay? Maybe Frankfurt as well, but Frankfurt prison, prison. Okay? So that's where the medium, that's where the, 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 the normal sinners are. But in Frunpint, when we get there, and I sit with these guys, and I look in their faces, and, and some of them are sitting and saying, I did this terrible sin. Can God forgive me? And when I say, when I say to them, when God forgives you, God forgives you completely, they go, yeah, but all the people still tell me I'm a sinner. Now I want to tell you today, stop listening to what the people are telling you, and start listening to what the Word of God says to you. The Word of God says to you, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Amen. You can read that in John, John 8. When the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. When the law sets you free, your sin is discovered. And the devil loves... Where's uh, my tissues today? Uh, I've got a different uh, thing in front here. Just bring me my tissues quickly. Thank you. Uh, there, Josh has got his one. Thank you. All right. Well, the, the, the devil comes, and the devil comes and he says, Ah! Your son, you've tried so hard. Let me just show you something quickly. Let me just put you. You see, that's what the devil does. <laughs> He comes, the devil comes and he and he comes and he says, Ah, your sin is still there, you're not gonna make it. Amen. And the harder you try, and I'm gonna be full of faith, at least it's whitewash and not sin. But <laughs> and he starts showing you your sin all over again. That's what the devil does. But when God comes, and the devil comes to you and he says, Ah, your sin. Whoops. <laughs> Oops. And the more he shows, tries to show you your sin, the more he cleans you. As yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because the devil cannot remind you and show you sin that is not in your life anymore. Amen. So it's only when you realize. I, my sin is not forgiven through the law. Yeah. My sin is forgiven through the price that Jesus paid. Amen. There is no more sin. Mm. And the devil can come and say, Yeah, but you did that. And then you say to him, Romans 6, <coughs> I've been buried with Christ. Oh. My old man is dead. Amen. He's been buried. The new man has come up. And then you say, as Paul said, I am. I'm now a new creation. Amen. The old has passed away. But if you only live just to try and cover your sins and you try through the law, through your works, through what you can do to cover your sins, your sins will be revealed again over and over and over. And every time you will have to start all over again trying to get rid of your sins. Did you know that when you confess your sins, God forgives you completely. You've got no more sin. When you sin the same sin again, we think, oh, there I fell into sin again. God says, no, 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 that's the first sin. I see now. Yeah, but Lord, I keep on doing it. God says, no, 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 I chose never to go back to the sins I've forgiven. I'm only seeing the sin now. And if you confess the sin now, I will forgive you. And, and sometimes we have to go because the Bible says the righteous falls seven times, but he stands up. He gets up seven times. And sometimes, every time I get up, I don't go and go, oh, there I've fallen again. I say, oh, I've fallen. What happens now? How did I fall? Let me get up. Lord, forgive me for my sin. And immediately he comes and he washes my sins away again. And it cleanses me from my sin. But when I, I'm trying as hard, and sometimes, that's why, and you've got to excuse me, but some of these, some of these uh, uh, programs, that, 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 that the humanistic programs that they call Christian programs, where they believe in a higher being, 
And then they tell you, every day you've got to confess, I am still an alcoholic. I am still a sex addict. I am still a, uh, I am still a, I am still a. That's not biblical. Biblical is, I am the righteousness of Christ. Because when Christ set me free, he set me free. Yeah, I might still fall into the same old sin again because the devil wants to get me back there. But every time I fall, I get up and I, and, and I get cleansed through the blood of Jesus and I say, I am free. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. Oh, I spent too much time on that. There's so much, so much I want to say. Uh, Matthew 23 verse 27 and 28 is such an interesting scripture because Jesus speaks to the Pharisees. What were the Pharisees doing? They were trying to prove how holy they were. They were trying to prove they had no sin. Remember the Pharisee that was in the temple that when the, when the, the, the tax collector came and he beat him, he said, Oh Lord, forgive me, poor sinner. And he came and he said, Oh Lord, thank you that I'm not like him. Thank you Lord that I fast once a week. I give my tithes of, every, of everything I have. We could have more Pharisees in the church. But no, no, no. But uh, I give my tithes and everything I, I have. I do all these things. I'm, I'm amazing. I, I do. I, I am okay, Lord. And Jesus looks at the Pharisees later and he says to them in Matthew 23, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs. You are whitewashed tombs. Which outwardly appear beautiful, it looks so clean, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Your sin will remain, even if this is white, washed completely, your sin will still be underneath there. Okay. I didn't want to spend so much time on that, but knowing me, that's just how it is. Eh? Alright, let me just give you three points uh, quickly. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Galatians 3 verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Uh, the second point. Christ redeemed us from the guilt of our sin. You don't have guilt anymore. But the people are still suffering because of what I did. That's their problem. That, that sounds bad. But I have to say this, this, this to someone this week. I have to say, that's their problem. If they can't come to Jesus and get rid of their hurt by Jesus, you can't take responsibility for what they're going through anymore. Because you are now clean. It sounds like, but that's not fair. Christ's righteousness is not humanly fair. But it's eternal faith. Okay. Romans 8 verse 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. We've been set free. Christ redeemed us from the power of sin. The third one. Christ redeemed us from the power of sin. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Sin will not rule in your hearts anymore. Okay, so that was just my first point. But don't worry, I only have two. The second point is, once Christ has forgiven me my sin, this is the question that most Christians ask, why do I still struggle with sin? Because the devil is out to get you back. He wants to draw you back to him. And the devil w walks around like a roaring lion, seeking those who he can devour. And the thief comes to steal and to, to destroy and to kill. But Jesus said, but I have come to give you life and life abundantly. So, so why is there still this struggle? It's like the struggling side of me. Why? You see, once Jesus has forgiven us our sins, we can't think that our responsibility is God. His responsibility is to remove sin from him. My responsibility is to stay away from sin. What did Joseph do? Joseph didn't say to Potiphar's wife, 
Okay, sister, I understand you've got a problem. Let's just discuss this problem a little bit. Let's just discuss how, how uh, uh, this is not part of God's plan. Let, 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 let's just try to, to, to work out why you feel the way you feel. No, Joseph didn't counsel Potiphar's wife. Joseph put on his tackies, his running shoes. And that's why the title is, How Fast Can You Run? And he fled. He ran away from temptation. He ran, ran away from sin. He got himself out of the position where sin is close by. We Christians think, oh, I'm so tough. I can handle it. I've heard people that, that said, I've stopped drinking, but I keep the bottle there so I can prove to this bottle, and it's not an empty bottle, I can prove to this bottle that I have conquered it. Don't be stupid. Because in every one of our lives, we come to a place where something happens and we are pushed down into the ground and we feel like everything we feel like the ground that we pushed into is not there anymore. And then what do we grab onto? We 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 try to grab onto Jesus and, and, and but sometimes we are so hurt, so messed up, so uh, and then we grab the closest thing that gives us a little bit of comfort. And it's usually the sin. Don't put your bottle close by. Break your bottle. Throw whatever's inside of the bottle down the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> flee from sin. And I want to show you that the Bible says flee from sin. The Bible doesn't say overcome sin by showing sin how strong you are. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says flee from sin. I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures to prove that to you. Alright? Uh, to, to flirting with sin leads to sin. Flirting with sin leads to sin. Okay? Um, uh, fleeing from sin is only when we have the fear of God in our hearts. You see, becoming familiar with God leads us to fleeting, uh, flirting with sin. When we start being pally pally with God. God is not our pal. He might be our friend. But he's not our pal. We've got to come to God. And we've got to know that God is God. And there's a fear of God that the Bible speaks about. Now listen to this. In Genesis 42 verse 18. A few chapters later when his brothers come. And they don't even know who he is yet. And he says you go back and you go fetch your little brother. And you come back to me. And, and, and they say all kinds of things. No we can't. And we won't. Uh, uh. He says. And listen to what he says. He says in verse 18, On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. How, how did Joseph handle all the problems that came in his life? Some of you think you had problems. His brothers took him and threw him into a pit. If you want to become a pastor, the pit stands for pastors in training. But they threw him into a pit. Okay? They threw him down there into, into this pit. That wasn't enough. They took him and they sold him. How many of you felt already in your life, I've been sold out? He was sold out, not by other people. He was sold out by his own blood brothers. Amen. They had the same father. Okay. And then he was sold into slavery. He comes into Potiphar's house. We see this thing. And then a lady that's got a big chip on her shoulder and an issue with sexual sin in her heart. She's got lust in her heart. And she comes and she tries to get him into bed. He flees from her. And what does she do? She accuses him. She accuses him of sin that he never did. And everybody believes her. I'm not sure Potiphar believed her. I think if Potiphar really believed her, he would have had Joseph executed. 
I think Potiphar was, I trust this guy. Maybe I don't trust my wife that much. But, but, but I'm not sure the Bible doesn't tell us. But anyway, he's been accused. And then he gets thrown into prison. How, how did he go through this? And it wasn't one year, it wasn't five months. It was, the Bible says, or not the Bible doesn't say, history teaches us, it was about 16 years from the day his brother sold him till the day he came to a place of fulfilling God's dream for his life. 16 years going through hell. How did he get through that? The fear of God. The fear of God. Let me just read you a few. Uh, let me just read verse, uh, verse 9 again uh, uh, from 39. Uh, he is not greater in this house. He speaks to the wife. He says, uh, He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you because you are his wife. Listen to what, 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 what Joseph says. He doesn't say, how can I sin against my master? He's so good to me. He doesn't say that. He says, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? My fear for God is greater than my fear for my master. My fear for God is greater than enjoying myself in some sin, uh, pleasures of sin. And just let me say that sin is always pleasurable. Otherwise people won't do sin. It doesn't end in pleasure. It ends in hell. But, but the, the fear of God in his heart. And then in verse 12, when she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me, but he left his garment in his hand and fled and got out of the house. Why did he do that? Because of the fear of God in his heart and in his life. I want to tell you, the church has lost the fear of God. We still love God, but we've lost the fear of God. Now, I think it was this week or somewhere now, the Pope, and I will say this on Facebook, the Pope has now said, we had the Pope, the Catholics, were one of the, the, the religious groups that were mostly against homosexuality. The Pope has now said, how can we say this is wrong when people love each other? They, God's grace is there so they can also have a family together. The Pope, and you know when the Pope speaks in the Catholic Church, everybody just says, it's as, if, as if God spoke. But God doesn't speak against His own word. And I will show you now in a moment. All right, so uh, the fear of God. Oh, there's so many things I want. Let me just keep going. Let me just read a few scriptures on the fear of God. Uh, uh, um, oh, yeah, here we go. Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. In, in, in uh, uh, Proverbs 8 verse 13, the fear of the Lord, listen, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech, I hate. Job 28, Job speaks in 28 verse 28, and he says, he said to man, behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to turn away from evil is understanding. What is he saying? If you have the fear of the Lord, you will flee from sin. Amen. So why don't we just put on our tackies and start running? We flee to Christ, but we flee from sin. What, what is he trying to say there to us? David Jeremiah says the following, he says, never try, and this is good news, or oh, 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 good advice for all of us today, never try to fight idolatry or immorality, or greed. Get as far away from it as you can. Those sins seem to have an incredible power over humans. Listen, idolatry, immorality, and greed <coughs> has incredible power over humans. Don't try to play with it. Don't try to overcome it. 
The Bible doesn't say overcome them. The Bible says flee from them. I'll give you the scriptures. Before I give you the scriptures, let me just say 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19, 9 to 11. Uh, and, and just, by the way, the way the Bible says flee, the word flee in the Greek is, is to you go, which means to run away as fast as you can. So I'm not lying to you when I'm preaching now. Okay. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 to 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulter uh, adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. I'm not saying these things. The Bible is saying this. I don't care what the Pope says. I don't care what the other churches say. I don't care what whoever says. What the Bible says is truth. And I'm not against the homosexual. They can be homosexual as much as they want. They're on their way to hell anyway. But that doesn't mean that you on your way to heaven if you're busy with your other sins. Okay? If we are sinning and not choosing to flee from sin and allow God to, to, to cleanse us, we will still go to heaven. So just keep on sinning and enjoy the ride. It will be a heated discussion when you get there. Okay, that was just plain words. And nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And when we read that, we go, oh, but, but that's me. I will never get to there. But he doesn't say, he said, carries on, he says, and such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Praise God. You can be cleansed. I don't care what you've done in your past. I don't care what you could have done the worst, worst, worst sin that you've ever done, that anybody else, you've done, done worse than anybody else in, on, this, on this earth. If you have repented and confessed your sin to God, to God, He cleanses you completely. Alright. So the Bible says, flee youthful passions. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.22 So flee, not walk, <laughs> not hang around and then disappear. Flee, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And just by the way, he doesn't say flee and be all alone. He says flee and then pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace. Wow. Along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Get together with some that call on the Lord with a pure heart. Get together to, with a pure people. Walk together with a pure people and it will help you to overcome sin. As you flee from it. Then he says, 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Flee from sexual immorality. <coughs> I've told this in, 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 in our Bibles, Bible school many times. So they hear many of the stories ten times. But it's okay. But uh, in, in, in our previous town where we lived, there was a pastor who committed, he, he committed sin. I almost said committed suicide, but he committed spiritual suicide anyway. He committed sin. He, he, he had a, a, an affair and later it came out that it wasn't just one, it was more. But anyway, when, when, this, when this affair came into the light, this was a big issue. And, and God sent the prophet to him. And, and this prophet stood in front of him and he said, Oh, it was the devil that did this. He said, Oh, the atmosphere. Because at that stage there was four different pastors and, and, and reverence and whatever uh, in, in the town that, that had committed adultery. And he said, uh, uh, the devil. And this prophet looked at him and said, just tell me, who pulled down your sin? You or the devil? We can't blame the devil. We can't blame certain situations. We can't blame because the Bible says, flee sexual immorality. Get don't tell me, yeah, but I'm stuck with pornography. I want to tell you, flee pornography. Get all these blocks, porn block or whatever they could. Get these things on your phone. Get these things on your, on your, on your, on your, on your, uh, uh, actually, even if you don't struggle with pornography, get those things on your phone anyway. Get those things that will block all these things on your phone. 
and put a, and let your wife put the password on. That'll be a good thing. <laughs> let your wife put the password on. I haven't done that, but maybe I will do that soon. Just to be a good example. But but flee the stuff. Don't 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 flirt with sin and think I'll be okay. Because it'll grab hold of you. It'll grab hold of your of your coat. It'll and, and not everybody's coat was as loose as Joseph's coat was. If it grabs hold of your coat and you can't get out of your coat, you've got trouble. Okay. Whew. Okay. Those watching, just keep watching, please. Uh, flee sexual immorality. I'm almost finished. Uh, my almost is always almost. F fly, flee idolatry. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. When God gives you the escape, make sure you've got your tackies on. And flee. Because he just says after that, that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Idolatry is anything that you put in your life above God. Whether it's your car, whether it's your wife, whether it's your children, whether it's anything that you put in your life above God is idolatry. Okay. Flee greed. Uh, 1 Timothy 6 verse 9 to 11. Let me say to the young people, listen carefully to what I'm saying. Okay. I've taught this to Joshua our whole life. Listen to this. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. If you desire to become rich, you've got a problem. But, but, that's success. I, I, I have to be successful. That's not success. That's stupidness. Because anything that you do against God's word is stupidness. Okay? He says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, evils. It is through this craving for money that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. He says, but as for you, O man of God, as for you, O woman of God, and I'm speaking to our young people, and I'm speaking to our older people as well, uh, as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Flee greed. Oh, but the money just came. If the money just came, it's a good idea to let the money just go. <laughs> I'm not saying, I'm not, uh, uh, let me not get into that now. And then, the last thing I want to say is stay away from sin. Listen to Proverbs 4. And I know I'm preaching long, but let me, let me just finish here. Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it. Avoid it, young people. Don't hang around with people. Do not go on. Avoid it. Do not go on. Turn away from it and pass on. If you struggle with alcohol, don't hang around with a lot of drinkers. Don't be stupid. If you struggle with pornography, don't watch TV programs with sexual content or check websites, etc. etc. If you struggle with gluttony, don't go alone to the grocery store. And definitely don't go with an empty stomach. Okay. Flee from these things. Make sure you've got things in place so that you can avoid these things. Alright? I want to put... Oh, some of you can't see up here. There's the word influence. Influence. Influence comes from the same root word that influenza. You know what influenza is? Flu, 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 just plain flu comes from. And flu is in the middle of influence. Your friends, my children in my house, your friends influence you. And as you catch flu just by being together with someone that has flu, so you will catch sin when you are together with those that are sin, sinful. Oh, but I'm strong. I'm not doing that. Don't be stupid. The Bible says flee. Get away from them. 
Okay? Amen. Ah. One bad apple. Influences. A whole box of apples. One bad influence in your life. Oh, but I'm going to win him for, to Christ. It's not your job to win him to Christ. That's the Holy Spirit's job. You can be a good example, but don't try and win them to Christ. Let the Holy Spirit do his job, because they will win you. If someone stands on a wall, and someone's at the bottom, and he wants to pull that person up, but that person wants to pull him down, who's got the biggest chance of pulling up or pulling down? The one at the bottom. If they don't want to be pulled up, you can't pull them up. But they can pull you down. Okay? Run, flee, get away from these things. Ephesians 4.27 And give no opportunity to the devil, the Bible says. Let me finish there. Don't play with temptation. Get rid of it. Fly off. That Jesus came and He set us free. He didn't come to cover our sins. He came to set us free from our sins. When He set us free from our sins, don't go play where your sins were. Flee. Get out of the position. Get out of the, the environment. Get out of where they are. And if you are forced in it by whatever, then you pray like you've never prayed before. God protect you. Protect my mind. And I take my mind now uh, uh, captive to, to the obedience of Christ. And don't give the devil any hope. Don't give the devil any opportunity in your life. I know I'm preaching, probably to the choir. I'm preaching to those that say, but I'm okay. I don't care if you're okay or not okay. Make sure that you're okay. That's why I'm preaching. Not to say that you're not okay. Just make sure that you're okay. Make sure that you get out of situations where the devil wants to draw you back and reveal your sin again. Because you've tried hard, but it's not working. Don't try so hard. Give it to Jesus. And then you flee from your sin. How fast can you run? <laughs> and if you couldn't, God will give you Holy Spirit feet. <laughs> it will take you with a speed away from your sin. Amen. If you choose to allow it to do that. Let's pray. Father, as we now come to the communion table and as we will share communion and enter into a time of worship I pray Lord that you will teach us firstly to understand that if you have set us free if you have forgiven our sins you have removed it from us as far as the east is from the west you have removed our sins completely from us and you have set us free but now our part is to remain far away from that sin as we can. And maybe we in situations and maybe the devil is, is enticing us and drawing us into situations. Help us, teach us, show us, reveal to us so that we can flee from those sins. And as we flee from those sins, we now flee to you. And as we come to the table now to have communion together, we want to spend time together just experiencing the fullness of what you did on Calvary for us, to cleanse us from all sin. And as we break the bread, we realize we are part of the body of Christ, and we need the body of Christ. We need the purity of the body of Christ with us to help us to keep away and to flee sin. And as we come to the, to the wine, grape juice, as we come to that part, we pray, Lord, as we partake of it, that the new covenant that you came to set in our lives, as we partake of it, that we will be reminded that our sins have been washed away. We are now the righteousness of Christ, justified, made righteous through what you did on the cross and not through our own works. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. We love you.